Yo, 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 students, what up, what up? This is your home girl, Mrs. T. We are now working on chapter seven, lesson four. And in our green math books, we're on page 316. Let's get our learning target in today. And we're focusing today on writing equations with two different variables. So our learning target says, I can write and represent equations in two variables. Let's get that down first. I can write and represent equations in two variables. So, so far in this chapter, we've been looking at equations that have just one letter involved. And so now we're gonna have two letters involved. So at the top of page 316, a um, couple of important things that we're going to talk about. It says an equation in two variables represents two quantities that change in relationship to one another. So it's going to be talking about two different things today instead of just one thing changing. So we're going to want to write that down. Put a little asterisk here. So equations in two variables is the heading we're going to put. And so what we just read there um, basically says the quantities are changing. So we have two this time. So two quantities are changing. Oops, let's go back there. And the next thing we'll probably talk about is solutions to those. So the second sentence on the top of 316 says, a solution of an equation in two variables is an ordered pair that makes the equation true. So we'll jot that down as well. What is the solution actually telling us? So the solution or answer is an ordered pair And remember, an ordered pair looks like this, where you have the x number first and the y number second. Um, and that makes the equation true. So we'll kind of glance through a couple examples to start off with dealing with these ordered pairs and seeing if a solution is actually in fact a solution to one of these equations. So we'll get to example one here and then we have a little bit more vocabulary to talk about after example one. So with example one, what we're doing here is we're identifying solutions of equations with two variables. So it says, tell whether the ordered pair is a solution of the equation. So these are yes or no answers that we're going to give after we do a little bit of math work. So let's put down, is the ordered pair a solution? So that's really what we're answering for these. So we have an A and a B for these ones. Um, question A says Y equals 2X. So we'll jot down the equation. And then it gives us the ordered pair. They tell us the ordered pair they want us to check is 3 comma 6. So they're asking, is this ordered pair a solution to this equation, Y equals 2X? So remember in our ordered pair vocabulary up here, the first number represents what our x axis would do, and the second number is our y. So up here we have an x and we have a y. So we're gonna put this three in this spot for x. And remember a two with an x attached is like multiplication. And then we're gonna take the six, which stands for the y, and we're gonna put it right here in for the y. So if I rewrote this using numbers instead of letters, we would have a six in the front instead of the y. Then we would have our equal sign. Then we would have our two. And instead of our x, we're gonna be multiplying by our number, which is a three. So on this half of the equation, we have a six, and then we have our equal sign. So now we need to do this math work. Two times three gives us six. 
And since 6 does in fact equal 6, we would say that yes, the ordered pair 3 comma 6 is a solution to this equation. So our answer would be yes, this is the solution. Let's take a look at item B. The equation they give us is y equals 4x subtract 3. So we have y equals 4x subtract 3. And the ordered pair that they give us this time is 4 comma 12. And remember the first item is our x item and the second item is our y. So we're going to rewrite this equation and we're going to take the little x and replace it with a 4. And we're going to take the little y and replace it with a 12. So instead of a y in the front, we're going to have a 12 in the front. Then our equal sign. Then I see a 4. And instead of 4 times x, we're going to do 4 times 4, since 4 right here is representing our x. So we have multiply that by 4. And this time we have a subtraction sign and a 3, so we'll do subtract 3. So on this half we have a 12. Then we have our equal sign, and now we have to do this math work over here. Remember that we always multiply before we subtract, so we have to do 4 times 4, which would give us 16, and then we would take away 3. 16 take away 3 gives us 13. Does 12 actually equal 13? Well, it does not actually equal 13. So our answer to is this 4 comma 12 a solution? We would say no. It is not a solution because our final answers do not equal each other. And that's how you figure out if an ordered pair is a solution to the equation. So if we take a look a little bit farther down the page on 316, there's a couple more highlighted words that we need to discuss. And these two words are really something that you probably have heard a lot in science class. Um, they are independent variables and dependent variables. And we need to know the difference between the two in math as well as in science. So it says you can use equations in two variables to represent situations involving two related quantities. The variable representing the quantity that can change freely is the independent variable. The other variable is called the dependent variable because its value depends on the independent variable. So to kind of simplify that sentence a little bit, Let's go ahead and just write the two vocabulary words. The first one is independent variable and an independent variable is the quantity that can change freely. And then the second one we talked about is dependent variable. And that one is the quantity that depends on the other to change. So when we're talking about an equation with two different things that are changing, one of them will just keep going no matter what, and the other one kind of depends on the first one to get its values. So we'll have some practice now determining which is which, which thing is the independent and which thing is the dependent variable. So we'll go ahead and look at example two. So for example two, we're using an equation now, we're using them with um, two variables. The equation y equals 128 minus 8x gives the amount y in fluid ounces of milk remaining in a gallon jug after you pour x cups. So we have an a and a b they're asking us. a says identify the independent and dependent variables and b says how much milk remains in the jug after you pour 10 cups. So a couple of different things are asking us to do. The first thing we need to do here in our work is to write out the equation that they're giving us. They give us y equals 128 subtract 
8x. So you can easily identify that there are two different quantities or variables here that are in our equation. Now they tell us in that sentence in the book what the x stands for and what the y stands for. It tells us that the y is going to stand for the amount of ounces of milk remaining in a gallon jug. So we're going to write down what that variable means. So y equals the amount of ounces of milk remaining in a gallon jug. So that's the Y stands for right in the front here. And then the X, they tell us in the sentence, represents the number of cups you pour out. So I'm going to put the number of cups you pour out. So now we've defined our variables. This is what the X stands for. This is what the Y stands for. So now we can get to the questions that they ask us. A asks us to identify the independent and the dependent variables. So we have one of these two things is going to be our independent variable or the quantity that changes no matter what. And then one of them is going to be the dependent variable. And the dependent variable is going to depend on the other one. So if we think about these two things, the amount of ounces of milk remaining in a gallon jug and the number of cups you pour out, one of those depends on the other. If you think about this logically, you can't actually calculate how much is left in the jug this amount up here, unless we know how many cups have pour, been poured out. So the Y actually depends on the X. And because it depends on the X, the Y is going to be our dependent variable. So Y is our dependent variable. In other words, the ounces that are left. And the X is going to be our independent variable, which is our cups that we pour out. The next question they're asking us, question B, says how much milk remains in the jug after you pour 10 cups? So they're asking us, what if we pour 10 cups out? The question would be, how much remains? Okay, well, let's take a look at this equation. Remember that one of these two letters represents the cups that are poured out, and that is our x. Our x represents how many cups are poured out. So if this x was changed into a 10 cups, we could easily figure out how much is left over. So our equation, y equals 128 subtract 8x is going to say, y equals 128 subtract 8 and instead of x we're going to multiply by 10 cups instead of x cups because they tell us that 10 cups have been poured out. So if I do this math work on the right side of my equation I should know what y stands for or how much is left over. Now remember in PEMDAS, we don't subtract first. We actually multiply before we subtract. So we have to do this part of the equation first before we can subtract. So 8 times 10 would give us 80. So now what I have to do is I have to take 128 and subtract 80 to get what my Y stands for. So if I do that math work and I do 128 minus 80, I actually end up with a remaining number of ounces of 48. So if I pour out 10 cups of milk, I have 48 ounces left in my gallon jug. So we have not only identified the independent and dependent variables, but we've actually used our equation to solve for one of our letters. You can pause the video there if you'd like and try the on your own to the bottom of page 316. If you tried those on your own, so let's take a look at number one. Um, number one should be no, it's not a solution. 
Number two is yes, it is a solution. Number three A, the independent variable would be X and the dependent variable would be Y. And then question B should be $105. Let's go ahead and move on to example three. Example three is focusing on tables and graphing. So if you're not super familiar with making graphs, this one will kind of help us beef up our skills in that area. So for example three, it says an athlete burns 200 calories weightlifting. The athlete then works out on an elliptical trainer and burns 10 calories for every minute on top of that. Write and graph an equation in two variables that represents the total number of calories burned during the workout. So taking some information down that they give us right off the bat here, um, we can say that the athlete they're talking about burns 200 calories weightlifting Then on top of that, they burn 10 calories per minute. I'm going to put C-A-L to represent calories per minute on an elliptical machine. So that's kind of the information they give us. And so the question they're wanting us to do is write and graph an equation with two variables. It represents the total number of calories burned during the workout. So we have two things that we're kind of comparing here. We have the total number of calories burned So that's something that they're wanting to know. And then the other thing that's kind of changing here, the two quantities that are changing, um, would be how many minutes are going on. So we have the total number of calories burned, and then we also have the time or the minutes that go by. So those are our two variables. So our time or our minutes are just going to keep going by. We can't stop time. And the total number of calories burned is going to really depend on how much time has gone by. Because the more time we're on our elliptical, the more calories that we're going to be burning. So if I were asked to define the independent and dependent variables here, the minutes would be my independent and my total number of calories burned would be my dependent variable. So what they're asking us to do is write an equation here. So if we want to do assign a letter to total number of calories burned, we could use a C for calories or a T for total calories. Um, and then if I wanted to assign a variable or a letter for the minutes that go by, you could maybe use an M for minutes. So you kind of just have to decide what letter you want to use when you're asked to write an equation. And the equation has asked us how much total. So let's start with the total equals. So if I wanted the total number of calories burned, it tells me up here that I burned 200 calories right away weightlifting. So I'm going to have that in my equation. And then on top of that, I'm going to add to that burning 10 calories per minute on an elliptical. So I'm going to add to that 10 calories per minute. Now when I say per minute, that means I have to multiply 10 times however many minutes that I've been working out. So 10 times my minutes can look like this, 10m or 10 times m. This equation is going to be what I'm going to use to figure out how many total calories that I would have burned. Now they want us to graph this information. So if I made a little graph over here, here's a y-axis and here's an x-axis. This is going to be kind of a rough graph. Um, let's put our minutes or our independent variable on the bottom. And then over here, we're going to put our total calories up the side. And we can put a zero calories. And then up the side, we can label how many calories we're going to have. Now it's probably important that we go kind of by bigger numbers because we start at 200. So if we start our first tick mark at 200 
and put a little squiggle here because we're kind of jumping quite a bit from 0 to 200. Then we can label each tick mark maybe by tens. So let's do 210, 220 calories, 230 calories, and then we could keep going if we wanted to. This line right here is going to be zero minutes, and then what happens after one minute, after two minutes, after three minutes, after four minutes. We could keep going if we want to. It doesn't necessarily say that we have to go to a certain amount of minutes, so we basically just have to put a few dots on our graph. So remember up here, it says the athlete burns 200 calories weightlifting. So before we've done any elliptical training, we can put a dot right here at the 200. We've already burned 200 calories without even doing any elliptical minutes. And then after one elliptical minute, we burn 10 more calories. So from this dot, if I go over to a minute, I'm at the 10 more calorie mark. So I can put a dot right here at 210 calories burned total. At two minutes, we burn another 10 calories, so we can put another dot right here. At three minutes, we burn another 10 calories, so we can put another dot right here. What you'll notice is that our dots are creating a nice straight line that would continue in that same pattern if I kept going in my minutes. So I'm going to put a little arrow on the end of my line to show that this pattern would con continue the whole time like that. So not only have I written an equation for this situation, I've also created a graph for it. And there is one more example in this chapter, or excuse me, in this lesson, um, but we are actually going to skip over that one because these three examples give us the majority of the content that we're looking for. Um, if you'd like to pause and try the on your own at the bottom of two, 317, go ahead and do that now. Okay, so if you created an equation for that situation, um, for the on your own number four, um, we would have two variables. They used a C and an H for their variables, but they have C equals 8H or 8 times H plus 25. And then they went ahead and graphed it. So it's kind of hard to explain what the graph looks like, but it does kind of create a same straight line that example three does. And that will be the end of lesson four in chapter seven.